Aang meets his past life, Avatar Roku, and gets the quest objective that will define his journey for the next several seasons. This is Avatar Explained for episode 108, Avatar Roku, part 1, synopsis. So Team Avatar travels to the Fire Nation. They need to go to a temple so Aang can meet Avatar Roku on the Winter Solstice. This is a challenge. They do not want to go into Fire Nation territory, but they really have no other choice. <laughs> Aang wants to go alone. He doesn't want to put the others in danger. But Katar and Sokka refuse to let him go unless they can come too. They're afraid that he's going to be in danger. They have a tough time once they get to the Fire Nation Temple, because all the sages, save one, want nothing to do with Aang. They view him as an enemy of the Fire Nation. This one sage succeeds in helping them, and he guides them through the temple, but they encounter trouble when they come to this door. They have to get through the door to see Roku on the other side. On this big door, there are five locks. As they only have one firebender, this sage, a problem is presented. Sokka comes up with a brilliant idea. They'll create their own firebending with explosives, setting all five locks off at the same time. They do this, but it doesn't work. Thankfully, it looks like it does, so they convince the other sages and Zuko, who has followed them, that Aang is inside the door. So the sages open the door, see Momo is the only one there, and realize they've been tricked. Thankfully, Team Avatar manages to overwhelm the sages and Zuko enough to get Aang past the door, where he meets Roku for the first time on the day of the winter solstice. Roku does not waste time. He tells Aang the truth, that he has to defeat the Fire Lord before Sozin's Comet comes, because Sozin's Comet will give the Fire Nation an extraordinary no amount of power, and they will be able to conquer the other nations and achieve total victory in the 100-year war. Aang panics. That's only less than a year to master three different elements. But Roku says he doesn't have an option. Either he does this, or he loses the war. Aang emerges from the doors, but he does not emerge as himself. He appears as Roku who defeats Zhao, who has followed Zuko to the Avatar. It's a glorious victory, and afterwards, Roku destroys the temple. They all manage to get out. The sages are all captured and brought to Fire Lord Ozai and called traitors, even though most of them tried to help the Fire Nation and hurt Aang. So, Aang turns back into Aang, and they all go on their way. But it's a dour moment, not just because the temple has been destroyed, but also because a nearly impossible task awaits them. If Aang doesn't master all these elements in time, and it is a very short amount of time, all hope for winning the war is lost. Part 2. Analysis Honestly, the introduction of the time limit is one of the most important parts of this great episode. Before the show had been meandering along, it had been good, don't get me wrong, and it had been very effective, but there was something languid about it. This episode cuts all that out. It's very tight as an episode, and it makes the whole show tighter going forward. Aang knows that he can't dilly-dally. He needs to work hard and not stop. They are at the winter solstice right now, which means they're at about at the end of the year, at least on our calendar. And Aang needs to defeat the Fire Lord by the end of summer. That gives him nine months, about. Nine months to defeat a ferocious empire that has conquered cities and lands around the world. It's a formidable challenge, and the show doesn't present it as anything otherwise. It knows how difficult this will be for Aang, and he's worried. He's very clearly worried. Thankfully, he has Katara and Sokka with him. This is one of the few shows about the power of friendship that isn't cliché or shallow or anodyne. It really shows how important it can be to have people with you who will help you out, help you get through the stiffest challenges in life. Team Avatar and the bonds between them are opposed to Zuko, who aside from Iroh really does not have anyone. His plan is good, but it doesn't work. He tries to distract Zhao by taking a little boat off the, the main boat to stop Zhao from following him. 
Unfortunately for him, Zhao sees through this, and here we see the conflict between them steadily building. For Zhao, capturing the Avatar is a way to advance his legacy. He's a very vain individual, very arrogant, very concerned with his own reputation, and he knows what capturing the Avatar would do for him. For Zuko, however, it's something much more desperate, something much more longing and yearning. There's still anger there and a sense of pride, but it's different. This isn't someone who already has a lot of status wanting to increase their status. This is someone who's lost everything, trying to claw his way back into his father's good graces. Even when Zuko is doing terrible things, like he is now, and even when we don't have as much information about him as we'll get later, there's something pitiable about him, something very sad. And that makes him very different from the standard capture the good guy and win praise kind of villain that we see often in shows like this. Even Zhao is kind of that villain, although he does bring more weight and gravitas to the role than we typically see. One more thing, I really appreciate how easily and clearly the characters' goals are defined. This can be a problem when you have a lot of characters. It can be easy to have character motivations that aren't clearly explained or that really don't make any sense, and it can be hard for the viewer, therefore, to have a real emotional investment in the conflict because they don't know who wants what and why. In this episode, however, that is very clear. All character motivations are very sharply and lucidly defined, not just in the large scale but also in the smaller scale. It's very apparent who wants what at every single moment, at every single point in time. The show really has a lot of momentum right now thanks to how well it communicates character motivations, and thanks to how it sets that timetable and establishes these rigid temporal stakes that Aang can't get around or use trickery to ignore. He has to face them. He has to master all the elements before the end of summer. There's real energy and propulsion in the show right now, which makes it a little unfortunate that the show squanders some of that going forward, though not all of it by any means. Okay, part three. Context. It is unfortunate how the show slows down from this point. Right now it really has a head of steam. It's really going fast. Not too fast, but just fast enough to convey a real sense of purpose and meaning and resonance. So it's a shame that kind of gets caught up in smaller scale storytelling again. Not that these stories are bad, the next two episodes in particular are maybe not quite as good as this one, but definitely very close. However, after that there is a stretch where the storytelling isn't quite as dynamic and cohesive as it could have been, and in some instances is just flat bad or mediocre. We have The Great Divide 111, we have one of my personal least favorite episodes, Bato of the Water Tribe, we have The Fortune Teller, Another episode that is rightfully not considered one of the best in the show. I don't hate all of the slower episodes, but it is sort of a letdown. Especially when we see how powerful the show can be when it carries itself with a sense of purpose, like we see here and in episode 103, The Southern Air Temple. There are neat parallels here with what the show will do later on. The most notable being how Roku allowing the temple to burn is like Aang setting the glider on fire in the start of Season 3. But what I consider more compelling is the role this episode plays in advancing, or one could say deteriorating, the psyches of these characters, particularly Zuko, whose desperation only increases from this point going forward. It was one thing when he only had to find the Avatar to reclaim his honor, as he puts it. By that he means gaining his father's approval. However, here the stakes have been raised. He not only has to capture the Avatar, he has to do it before Zhao can. Even though Zhao has far more resources, Zuko is kind of the underdog to an extent, and that makes it a little easier to sympathize with him, even though the actions he commits are wrong. Which of course makes it easier for the show to transition him into being a fully sympathetic character, later on. But yeah, overall this is a very strong episode, easily one of the strongest we've seen so far. I hope you're enjoying this. Thank you for watching. If you liked what you saw today, 
consider donating to my Patreon if you can. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Watch more Avatar. And I hope you come back for more analyses soon. Adios, comrades!